So the following scene has played itself out many times in my ministry. Picture the scene with me for a moment. We're at a graveside, and there's maybe a small family. Sometimes there are extended families. Sometimes there's dozens and dozens of people, and they're all grieving. Some of them may be members of West Side. Some of them are Christians. Some of them may be new Christians. Some of them may not be Christian at all. Some of them may not even believe in God. So there I am as a shepherd seeking to be helpful to the family. And I often say these words, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Sometimes I wonder, do I believe this? Are these words true? Are they even helpful in that moment? And then there's that other part of me that knows that these aren't my words. These are our words. These are the words that Jesus spoke. And I know them to be true. We remember today that these are words that Jesus speaks to a particular person, Martha. Now, you may remember Martha. Martha, in the Gospel of Luke, that wonderful story, she is the host for Jesus when Jesus comes to stay at the home of Martha and Mary and Lazarus, and she's in the kitchen. Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus, engaging in conversation, communion with Jesus, and Martha's getting annoyed. And you remember what Jesus says to Martha. She said, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by too many things. Mary has chosen the better part, the part that won't be taken from her. Today we look at this final I am statement in this series. And if you know the Gospel of John well, you know that there's actually two more I am statements that we're not going to be covering this year. And those are, I am the way and the truth and the life, and I am the true vine. Now, I thought I did, I am the way and the truth and the life a few years ago. It's been a number of years, so I'm going to take that on, I promise you, in this coming year, because that text has been weaponized, and I want to make sure that we don't misuse that text. The second, I am the true vine, we'll look at on Earth Day. And know about that text, that that text inspired West Side Story 1. When we created our vision statement, we were very much prayerfully spending some time with that text. And this idea of being connected to the vine grower's power and growing in faith and serving the world comes very much out of that, that text and that image. This Lent, we've been looking at these I am statements to better understand who Jesus is and to better understand who God is, the great I am. So these are statements that Jesus is making about himself and they're statements he's making about the nature of who God is. God is a God who shines light on injustice. God is a God who provides nourishment for us. God is the one who is the door to eternal life. God is the shepherding energy and presence in our lives. But we've dug a little deeper this Lent because Lent is a time to do hard work, to do the important work of sanctification in our lives. So these statements also have a claim upon our lives. They shape us as children of God and as followers of Jesus. So we are called in our own lives to be the kind of community that shines light on the injustices that we see wherever and whenever we see it. We're called to be bread for a hungry world. We're called to be a doorway into the presence of the living Christ. We're called to be a shepherding people, inviting people into an ever-expanding community of Christ's love in the world. So today we turn to I am the resurrection and the life. I struggled with this early in the week. I was thinking, am I going to do an Easter sermon two weeks before Easter? And I almost let it go. Debbie will tell you. I was in her office. I don't know if I want to work with this text. And it is a preview to Easter Sunday. 
And we'll talk on Easter Sunday about the resurrection and specifically its implications for our daily lives. But it is also a preview of perhaps Jesus' most famous miracle, which is the raising of his dear friend Lazarus from the dead. Which begins, you may recall, with Jesus weeping at Lazarus' tomb. And it ends or culminates with Jesus saying, Lazarus, come out. Now as a side note but very particular to the message of this season of Lent, Jesus does not do this miracle by himself. He invites the community into the miracle-making process. He invites the community to help roll away the stone and to unbind Lazarus. So it's not just Jesus saying, look at, look at me, look at the miracle-making power that I have. He's not even saying only look at God. He's saying look at what we can do together. Look what miracle-making we can do together in my name. So Jesus says to Martha, trust me. The resurrection will happen, and I am the resurrection and the life. Now, Martha seems to be a good student. She knows at the end of time the resurrection will happen, but Jesus is inviting her from the future to the present. He's saying, right here, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He's inviting her, as we are being invited, to embrace eternal life now, right here, in the midst of our lives, in the midst of whatever's going on today. He's inviting us as disciples to embody that resurrection and life wherever we are and with whomever we are with, to do that for others in the world, to be a resurrecting, life-giving presence in the community. The Greek word pistis, which is at the heart of the question that Jesus asked Martha, can be translated belief or believe as it often is. But I think it's better translated trust because it's one thing to believe in the resurrection. That's important. It's a whole other thing to trust it in the resurrection, to trust in the resurrecting process. Beliefs by themselves have no claim upon our lives. We have to learn to put those beliefs into practice, into action, to embody them with words, with presence, with action. To trust in the resurrection is to go into those places of suffering in our lives and in other people's lives with where resurrection and life are needed with that type of presence, with that kind of presence in, in the midst of that suffering. It's there that we're called to give witness to the life that never ends. A couple weeks ago at Wellness Wednesday, we had uh, Patty Williams with us, who's a wonderful person. And for about 20 years, she's been running a grief group out of the First Presbyterian Church of Cranford, New Jersey. In 2002, she was commissioned by her husband, who happened to be the pastor, Bruce Williams, to lead a grief group, to develop a grief group. There were many people, like there are many people here, who were suffering from grief, and she was trying to create some space. And so she worked with this psychologist, and they developed this program. It was presented to the session. It was approved, and she was ready to start her first class, and her husband, 51 years old, dropped dead of a massive heart attack. So there she was, about to do a program on grief, in the throes of grief herself foundation-shaking event left with three children to care for on her own. So what did she do? She pressed on. She did the program, the first program of what has become 20 plus years of programs that have touched and ministered to over a thousand people. During COVID, what did she do? She pressed on. They went online and now the program is is online. It's a virtual program. A number of Westsiders participated in it, in it uh, earlier this year. We'll have another opportunity on April 16th, a seven-week series, which was uh, advertised to you beginning on Friday, and any of you can participate in it. Patty defined grief on that Wednesday as a protest of the mind, body, and spirit against the reality of death. A protest of the mind, body, and spirit against the reality of death. 
She shared with us briefly the five tasks of grief work, the first of which is accepting the reality of the loss. She said that step often takes a lot of time because intellectually we get it. That person isn't here. That one happens pretty quickly, that aha. It's the heart that needs time to catch up with the head. It's the emotions that are as important in the accepting of reality as anything else. And so step one is about letting your heart grieve the painful reality of the loss. The second task is to get to the point of pain. Now it's worth noting, and I I always am drawn to this, this insight, in the Lazarus miracle, you would think that Jesus has an inkling, I'm going to raise my friend up, right? So why would he weep? The scripture tells us he weeps at the tomb of Lazarus. Belief in the resurrection does not immunize us from suffering. In fact, what I think it does is it gives us permission to trust that process of grief. One could say that Jesus doesn't simply believe in the resurrection, but he trusts it not only for others, but maybe most importantly in that story for himself. The first two tasks, like the three to follow, lead us through a process that we don't control, we can't manufacture, and it can't be rushed. For grief work is as simple and as hard as putting one step in front of the other. Taking one day, literally, at a time in order to allow the work to continue to transform us and lead us to resurrected life. Patty gave us a wonderful way to respond. A lot of times when someone's grieving, people ask, how are you? Now, that can be helpful if we're really willing to hear the real answer. A lot of times we're not. A lot of times we say, how are you? Please don't tell me you're not doing well because I don't know what to do with that. But she said, most of the time it's not a helpful question. But if someone happens to ask you when you're grieving, here's what you can say. I am right where I need to be. I am right where I need to be. I think that's what it means to trust in the resurrection. To trust in the process of going through the suffering, not fast-tracking, not smiling our way through it, not pretending that we're above suffering because we believe in the resurrection. No, one foot in front of the other, step by step by step, which includes going to the point of pain and saying, you know what, I'm right where I need to be. If we're growing What awaits us through the grief work is a deeper sense of the precious fragility of life, the gift of life. And if we do the work, it opens us up to the suffering of our brothers and sisters, the suffering of our planet. We become more tender, more sensitized to suffering wherever we see it, and we become safer human beings because we're able to trust the process that others are going through as much as we trust it for ourselves. But it's work, and we have to consciously choose the work. And whether or not we choose to do the work has consequences not only for us, but for everybody else in our lives. The Reverend Billy Graham used to say it this way, the same sun that melts butter hardens clay. The same sun that melts butter hardens clay. The question when we are grieving or when we're in the presence of suffering, will it soften our heart or will we protect ourselves and harden ourselves against reality, our reality or somebody else's? Will suffering tenderize us or harden us? Will it make us bitter or will it make us better? Good grief, and I love that phrase even though it's a little strange, good grief is about resisting the temptation towards bitterness and hardness. And it's about opening ourselves to that tenderizing grief work that allows us to be more compassionate, that opens us up to a felt sense of the reality of Christ's resurrecting love. 
What often gets lost in this story of the raising of Lazarus is what happens next. He isn't simply raised from the dead, which is wonderful, right? He is raised to new life and even more specifically, new life with Jesus. Later in the Gospel of John, we see Lazarus, like Mary earlier, leaning on the breast of Jesus, sharing fellowship and a meal with him. So we are called to new life with Jesus, a more intimate life with Christ, where we share fellowship, where we share life with him. Because it's not simply the death of Jesus that saves. It's the life of Jesus that saves. Do you feel the difference? The life of Jesus, the life with Jesus has saving power. For Jesus came to reveal once and for all the Christ that dwells at the heart of all of life, all created life. Remember how John begins his gospel. In the beginning was the Word. In the beginning was Christ. And Christ became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen his glory, full of grace and truth. In his classic book, Falling Upward, Richard Rohr builds upon John's idea that eternal life is not just the life to come, but is present always, right here, available to us always. Richard writes, most people confuse their life situation with their life. They confuse, we confuse our life situation, what's happening right now with our life but life is the underlying flow beneath the everyday events of our lives. And with practice, with prayer and meditation, we can learn to drop down and touch that deeper life. No matter what's going on, no matter whether we're experiencing great joy or experiencing great sorrow. Because the Christ that Jesus comes to reveal for us is present in all things, in all circumstances, in all people, ourselves included, no matter what is going on. St. Ignatius of Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits, taught his students a very important exercise. He taught them to pay attention to moments of consolation and moments of desolation. Moments of consolation are those moments that are sweet. We want to hold on to them forever, right? Life is good. We're connected to life. We're connected to others. There's joy, a sense of aliveness. Desolation are those experiences that, you know, feel like they're diminishing us. They overwhelm us. We lose energy. We lose a sense of connectedness, lose vitality. And as good Western people, we would think, well, isn't the goal to maximize the consolation and to minimize the desolation? That's actually not the teaching, and it's not the goal. Because Ignatius understood that consolation, which is a gift, can also be an excuse to ev evade and avoid the hard stuff, to put on a happy face to be militantly positive about everything, no matter what's really going on. It can be an excuse to stay immature. On the other hand, desolation, which is painful and hard every single time, can be a gift, albeit a strange gift, because it can force us to break patterns in our lives that aren't helpful, that don't serve us and don't serve others. So what did he teach his students? He taught them to be lovingly detached from consolation and desolation. To notice it. It's important to notice it. But to try to be connected to the Christ, the flow that is present in all things. So we see it, we recognize it, but we aren't attached to it because we know that Christ is the deepest reality. And so we condition ourselves to stay in touch with that through practice. You see, Ignatius understood what John does, what Jesus did, that his gift to us 
is not simply to save us from death, but to save us for life. And Jesus says to us, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. We're left with the same question Martha is. Do you believe that? Or maybe more importantly, do you trust that? Amen.